Okay, we continue in our series for 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy for Beginners. This is lesson number three in the series, Paul's Personal Witness, 1 Timothy chapter one, verses 12 to 20. Now, in our last lesson, we began looking at the text of Paul's first letter to Timothy. And in chapter one, verses one to 11, um, we uh, read about some of the problems that Timothy was having and uh, the things that Timothy had to do to counter those problems. Uh, by the way, we have to understand that Paul didn't write his letters you know, with uh, chapter and verse divisions like we see in our Bibles. Uh, we sometimes think that uh, <laughs> you know, verse 14, verse 15, that was added later on. Uh, the letters uh, in those days were like most writing of the times that had all capital letters, little punctuation, no paragraph breaks or very few paragraph breaks as you see in the picture of the document that we're showing you, the Codex Washington, fourth century. Uh, the grammatical points and uh, chapter and verse divisions uh, were added much later when the letters were collected into a complete set uh, for publication. Uh, these made it easier for the readers to find and to memorize uh, particular passages. Anyways, uh, in verses one to 11, Paul sets out to accomplish two important things in his communication with uh, Timothy, the uh, young evangelist. First thing, well, first thing is he establishes Timothy and his teachings as legitimate and from God. We saw in the last week, we saw at the beginning of the letter, Paul uh, introduces himself as one who was selected by God. He's an apostle, not any apostle, not any messenger, but one of the apostles uh, chosen by God. And Timothy is someone that he sent. And so there's a chain of authority there from Christ to Paul, from Paul to Timothy, establishing the authority of his role as apostle and uh, teaching. You know, Timothy was a young preacher and he was facing difficult opponents in the church and Paul wanted to back him up, so to speak, with his own apostolic approval. I mean, it's so contemporary, isn't it? You know, uh, I've been in the field uh, doing mission work in a, in, a, in a small church that doesn't have elders or deacons, you know, it's just, a, you know, church was just starting out, maybe, you know, 75, 80 members, 100 members, and something would happen in the church. A problem needed to be resolved. Uh, and I, as the missionary, uh, would be part of a meeting where we would try to sort things out. Uh, but there were times when the elders who had sent me to do this work, who oversaw my work in the field, some of them either wrote letters or actually came out to help me uh, you know, uh, establish a certain point of order or perhaps uh, settle some divisive uh, uh, activity taking place in the church. In other words, the elders, and this is many, many years ago when I was just starting out in ministry, but the elders would come out and, and quote, back me up, support me. Uh, not just me personally, but support what I was teaching uh, was legitimately what the Bible taught when there was an issue as far as those things were concerned. So what Paul is doing here with Timothy uh, 2000 years ago, uh, elders uh, have done with uh, uh, evangelists that they oversee in the field uh, over and over again. It's a common thing. Uh, the second thing also uh, in, in what we read previously um, about the false teachers and the trouble taking place in Ephesus, uh, Paul also condemned the teachings of those Gnostic teachers. Their teaching strayed from apostolic teaching. Well, apostolic teaching was the teaching of Christ because Christ gave it to the apostles, the apostles passed it on, if you wish. And so Paul was condemning the teaching of these Gnostic teachers, and he was confirming or backing up that what Timothy taught, regardless of his age and experience, what Timothy thought, taught was accurate and according uh, 
to God's uh, word according to what he, Paul, was teaching and what Paul was teaching was according to what the other apostles uh, were teaching as well. And so the apostle draws a, a line in the sand, as it were, about approved teachers and teachings. And once he's done this, he changes directions and offers a short prayer of thanksgiving before going on to tackle other issues that were taking place in the church, issues that required uh, experience, uh, issues that required uh, Paul's input, Paul's teaching, Paul's experience uh, for um, young Timothy. Now Paul gives thanks to God not only for giving him the ministry of apostleship in, in this prayer, uh, but also he thanks God for enabling him to actually do the difficult work of an apostle. So he was thankful to be chosen to serve God and he was thankful for having had the opportunity of serving God for many uh, years and in a very dynamic way. So let's re begin reading his prayer. Verse 12, he says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. And so Paul's ministry comes from Christ, who originally called him and has sustained him through his many trials. Jesus called him to ministry. Jesus, through the Spirit, through the church, trained him. Jesus, through the Spirit of prophecy, sent him out, Acts 13, to do the work and Jesus sustained his strength and his faith and his courage while out in the field because he, you know, Paul, as we know, especially if we read the book of Acts, uh, sustained a lot of uh, opposition, uh, beatings, uh, they tried to kill him and uh, imprisonments and through it all, he gives thanks that uh, Jesus has, has sustained him through this. The false teachers were claiming some kind of authority based on their knowledge of secret information. And so Paul contrasts this by explaining his relationship and knowledge of Christ who authorized and supported him in ministry. And he describes this relationship in the context of uh, a prayer. So basically he's saying uh, to Timothy, you know, these, these, these uh, false teachers here, these Gnostic teachers, they have their secret knowledge but I have a personal relationship with Christ. They've appointed themselves as you know, rabbis, teachers of the law. On, on, in, in my experience, Jesus has selected me. Uh, th these, these false teachers have you know, been self-appointed to be the teachers. I have been appointed and sent out to do the work of Christ by Christ himself. You know, he, you know, always between the lines, he's comparing his experience, he's comparing his calling, he's comparing his teaching and all of that to that of the uh, false teachers. You have to kind of keep your eye on the ball as far as that is concerned. This is what this is about, especially in this, uh, uh, this section. Uh, verse 13 and 14, he says, even though, you know, in other words, I was selected by Jesus, I was sent out to the field, he sustained me in my ministry, and then he says, even though, I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found uh, in, Christ, uh, in Christ Jesus. And so his main point about this is that he did not deserve to be an apostle. You know, he didn't boast, you know, he was saying, look, I was selected by Christ, I was taught by Christ, I was sent out by Christ, I was sustained by Christ. He's not boasting about that, that just, you know, that's the way his ministry has worked. He's not boasting about it. His main point actually is that he didn't deserve to be an apostle, he didn't deserve any of this. And he described who he used to be before God called him. He was a blasphemer, in other words, he denounced Christ as a fake and a troublemaker when he, Paul, was a Pharisee. Well, that's blasphemy. You know, you, if, some people think, you know, if I say these kind of things against the Father, that's blasphemy. But if I say them against Jesus, well, that's just you know, trash talk. No, Jesus is God. 
to speak against him, to denounce him as fake, as a devil, as a troublemaker, you know, as a liar, this is blasphemy because you're, you're, you're charging the Son of God with these type of things. And he says, that's who I was. I was a persecutor, in other words, he was a tormentor and a hunter of Christians and he tortured them and jailed them and he even approved when some of them were killed. We know that when Stephen was murdered, he was there approving of it and holding the coats, go ahead, you know, throw another rock, I got, I got your back here, I got your coat. And he was a violent aggressor. He was insolent and insulting and aggressive and angry with Jesus and his people. I mean, he was out to destroy the church. And so he said, this is who he was when he met Christ. One who opposed the Lord violently and tried wholeheartedly to kill and imprison Jesus' people, Jesus' followers. That's who I was. This is why he says he was unworthy to be a leader, never mind to become just a disciple of Jesus. That's one thing, you know, Jesus could have appeared to him on the road to Damascus and said, it's me, it's Jesus. And Paul could have said, oh Lord, I'm sorry, I didn't know. And he's baptized and he becomes a disciple and he kind of disappears into, into history. A brief mention of, of an individual who was converted, just like many were converted at the beginning. You know, we read about Lydia who was converted and we, we read about her conversion, but then she passes out of sight. We don't see her anymore. Just like many of the jailer, uh, you know, the Philippian jailer and his family, they were converted, but then we don't see them anymore. Well, in the same way, Paul could have been converted and just you know, pass on through and we don't see him anymore. But that's not the case, is it? Jesus not only appeared to him, not only called him to be a disciple, but gave him the opportunity to be a leader in the church. This is why Paul is saying, hey, I, 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 you know, I may not even have deserved to become a Christian. I was such a bad person. I, I, I was called to be a leader on top of that. And so despite all of this, he says, God had mercy on him because he did all of these things in ignorance. He didn't really know. I'm wondering if, when Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, if he wasn't also talking about Paul at that moment. Now, even though he was ignorant and trying to please God in his own way, he was still sinning. He was guilty of sin, even if he didn't realize it then. Remember, the, the law of sin and death works whether you agree with it or not. You know, the spiritual law that says if you sin, you die. You know, that law is universal. It doesn't matter if you agree or disagree, that law, you know, like gravity, you know, is in play. And so even though he did what he did in ignorance and he was very zealous thinking he was pleasing God, he was still sinning. He was still lost. He would have been condemned. But God showed him mercy by sending someone to preach the gospel to him, not by simply accepting his zeal or his sincerity, no, no, like everyone else, Paul had to hear the gospel and respond to it. You know, sincerity and zeal does not wash away our sins. It's the blood of Christ that washes away sin. And this is done, of course, in the waters of uh, baptism, as Ananias in Acts twenty two sixteen, 16, you know, he preaches the gospel to uh, Paul, but then what does he say? Saul, Saul, why do you await? You know, what are you waiting for? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins. So Paul, like everybody else, from Pentecost until the end of the world, like everyone else, Paul had to hear the gospel and then needed to respond to it in faith. And that faith expressed how? In repentance and baptism. And of course, Paul uh, did that as well. So God's love and mercy was shown to Paul in several ways. First of all, Christ came to die for his sins. Uh, the preacher who baptized me many, many years ago used to say, I don't know where he got this, but he used to say, even if you were the only person in the world, you, the, here's the whole earth and you're, you're just one person that's living on the earth, Christ would have come and died just for you. 
He died for everybody, but if there was only one human being, he would have done the same. I mean, you know, the analogy doesn't work in every which way, you know, but you understand the point I'm making. The salvation that Jesus obtained by his sacrifice is not just for a group of people, it's for each individual person who responds to, to him. So Christ came to die for Paul's sins as well. Uh, secondly, God kept him alive to show him the ministry and the blessings that would be given to him. He could have been killed you know, before then, and while he was serving Jesus, he could have been killed. They tried to kill him many times by stoning him. They chased him out of one or two different cities, three different cities I can think of. And yet, even though he was injured many times and he was cold and hungry and so on and so forth, they never managed to kill him. God spared his life. And thirdly, God gave him the ministry of announcing the gospel, the good news, to everyone that was seeking him. So God gave him a ministry. And so this grace and the faith and the love with which it was offered and received was sufficient to save him and reset the course of his life. Now what is unsaid is that he didn't need secret or special knowledge to gain these things in his life. Remember I said keep your eye on the ball here on what this is about, the Gnostic teachers. And so he, Paul, you know, who was who he was, was called by, by God through the gospel. Jesus died for his sin, God kept him alive, God gave him a ministry. Notice, no secret knowledge there. Everything out in the open. He was called in the same way that all other people are called to believe and to repent and be baptized. And so in verse 15, he says it's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. So here, this passage here, Paul quotes one of the many, quote, sayings that were circulating in the church at the time. You know, we have sayings in the church, right? Uh, that are not necessarily quotes from the scripture. I mean, they, 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 they they express ideas in the scripture, but they're not exactly quotes like, you know, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord. You know. Or what would Jesus do, right? What would Jesus do? That's a good idea, of course. You know, uh, when faced with some decision or some situation, you ask yourself, well, what would the Lord do? That's a thing we have, that's a saying we have. It's not specifically in the Bible. There's nowhere in the New Testament, for example, where a Bible character, an apostle or somebody says, well, what would Jesus do? You know that, okay. Well, in the same way, one of the sayings of that time was, Christ came into the world to save sinners. That was the saying that was going around. So Paul quotes the saying and he confirms it as true when he compares this saying with his own life. In other words, he is the epitome of this saying. Okay? He's saying, look, you know, uh, uh, it's a trustworthy statement, that's the saying, you know, deserving full acceptance because it's true. That what? Christ came into the world to save sinners. That, 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 that saying is going around. And you know what? That is so true because look at my life. I was the worst of sinners and Christ came to save me. Then in verse 16, he says, yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me as the foremost, and in brackets, sinner, okay, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. So not only is this saying true, he says, and true about him in particular, Paul says that he should be the poster boy for this saying, so others like him could have confidence in God. The idea is that if God can forgive me, the chief sinner, look at what I did. You know, I tried to stop and destroy the work and the people of God. So if God can forgive me, then he can forgive anybody. That's the point of this passage. Should be very, you know, very encouraging to those who were thinking, Oh, I'm just too sinful, you know, I'm just too bad a person, God doesn't really want me. And you know, interesting, he's saying this here to reach out to those people 
who may be thinking this about themselves. This is 2,000 years ago, and yet even today I've heard that many times. People that I've studied with say, well, God doesn't want me. I've, got, I've had such a bad life. I've done so many things wrong. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a lost cause. And Paul is saying, look, if God can forgive me, the worst of sinners, He can forgive you, and that is still true, very true today. Well, in verse 17, we have what's called a doxology. It says, or he writes now, to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever, amen. A doxology uh, is spontaneous praise. So here, Paul is so overwhelmed with thanksgiving you know, at the thought that he, the, the, the terrible sinner, was saved and called by God and given this fantastic ministry. He's so overwhelmed by everything that he breaks out in spontaneous praise to God. He says very specific things that we believe God to be, right? He says that God is eternal. He's without beginning or end. He says that God is immortal. In other words, he's not subject to decay. And he is invisible, meaning he's spiritual. He's a spiritual being. Such a being deserves, he says, honor and glory forever. Why? Because no one else is worthy of this kind of praise. Have you never said that in your prayers? Only you, Lord, are worthy of grace. Only you, God, are worthy of honor and praise. I mean, so such a statement. Who else is worthy of praise and honor, obedience, devotion, adoration? Is there any one or thing that is worthy of that other than God? And the answer, of course, is no, only he is like this. So Paul kind of, you know, he, he's, he's saying to them, uh, you know, I, I, this is how I came to Christ. I didn't need secret knowledge. You know, God found me, God preached the gospel to me, God gave me a ministry, no secret knowledge there. And then when he contemplates this, this the wonder that God has you know, given to him, he breaks out in praise and describes some of the features, uh, some of the uh, features of, of God's uh, character and person. Now, in the last part of this chapter, Paul kind of uh, renews his charge to Timothy. So we go to verse 18 and he says, this command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight. And so the charge or the mission was originally given to Timothy based on what the Holy Spirit said about him through the prophets in the church. Remember, in those days, they didn't have the written word, but they had individuals who had the gift of prophecy, the ability to speak uh, for God, if you wish. All right. So in the early church, as I said, those with the gift of prophecy served to guide the church until the Bible was completed and recorded and eventually uh, distributed. We read about that in Ephesians chapter four. Uh, verses 11 and 12. So Paul reminds Timothy that since he was chosen in this way, he should have confidence to enter into the battle against the false teachers. Again, he doesn't mention the false teachers, but it's about the false teachers. The false teachers have appointed themselves. The false teachers are declaring the authority based on themselves. When he talks about Timothy, he says, but you, Timothy, you've been selected through the agency of prophecy. In other words, the Spirit speaking through the prophets in the church called you out as an individual uh, for uh, the ministry that you have. That's your authority, that's your calling. And he's kind of telling them, remember who you are, remember how you have been called, remember the authority that's been given to you by God through uh, the prophecy of, of those uh, in the church. Um, and so if God chose him for ministry, well then God will be with him in ministry. I've said it many times, if God calls you to a ministry, he'll provide what you need for that ministry. He doesn't just call you and then leave you alone, doesn't provide you with anything. You know, if he calls you to ministry, he'll provide for you in ministry. Verse 19, the first part, he says, keeping faith and a good conscience. So Paul now explains the strategy one needs in order to be able to fight that good fight in the name of the Lord. And the first thing that you need is, you need to keep the faith. 
In other words, maintain, preserve the faith, not just faith, like you know, continue believing, that too, but in this case, keep the faith, meaning the doctrine, the teaching, keep that, preserve that uh, from one generation to the other. So as an evangelist, the way you fight the good fight is make sure that you maintain the teaching of the gospel. You maintain it in your heart and you maintain it in your teaching. Keep preaching and arguing for Christ-centered doctrines. Keep believing these and encourage others to continue believing these. And then the second thing he says, keep a good conscience. Faith and moral standards, they go together. If your morals fall, your faith won't be far behind. You can't remain faithful or be effective in helping others to remain faithful if your moral life isn't good. Peter says we need to add to our faith moral excellence, 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse five. You know, many times false doctrine or falling away from Christ is preceded by a moral decline. You know, we do something wrong, we do something, you know, we're engaged in some secret sin and so on and so forth, and we begin diluting the doctrine and the teaching you know, uh, to be able to cover what we're doing wrong. Does God really say that that's bad? Is God really going to punish us for that? You know? That we have, to, we have to keep a good conscience, a clear conscience. And so Paul continues in verse 19b, he says, which some have rejected, you know, keeping the faith, keeping a good conscience, keeping you know, good doctrine. He says, some have rejected this and they've suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. So Paul gives example of those in the church who have rejected these principles. Keeping the faith, you know, solid doctrine, maintaining a moral excellence. You know, he mentions a couple that have you know, uh, rejected these principles and have ruined their faith as a consequence. And he mentions two men, uh, uh, Hymenaeus, uh, who is described in 2 Timothy 2.17, so we'll, we'll read about him uh, later when we get to 2 Timothy, and his brother Alexander. Uh, and just to be clear, not the blacksmith that's mentioned in 2 Timothy 4. Uh, verse 14, so these two individuals he's talking about. So Paul says that they were delivered to Satan, which, which uh, is a figurative way of saying that they were disciplined. You know, we use terms uh, like that today, don't we? Like, uh, man, I took a beating on the stock market. It doesn't mean that you were actually physically beaten, right? It means you lost money. Or my computer crashed. Well, it doesn't mean it actually hit the floor and broke, although that might be what you'd like to do to it. But you know, we use euphemisms, we use, we use metaphors, terms, you know, to describe a certain thing. Well, there are a lot of reasons and ways to be, to be disciplined in the church. Uh, for example, uh, for public immorality, Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 5. Uh, there it was incest, the man had his father's wife, if you wish. Uh, and the punishment there was to withdraw from that uh, individual so that he would uh, recognize his sin. Uh, heresy or causing division, teaching false things or creating division in the uh, church. Uh, again, uh, in Romans 16, 17, Paul uh, talks about withdrawing from those people, always withdrawing fellowship in order to point out the error of their ways. Uh, idleness and, and gossip, uh, Paul talks about in 2 Thessalonians 3, people not working on purpose and meddling in other people's lives. You know, again, the way to discipline them is to withdraw from them. Uh, he talks about those who are disobedient. They will not obey the scriptures or they, they rebel against a legitimate leadership in the church, again, to withdraw from those people, to warn them and to withdraw from them. Those who show a party spirit, I don't mean party like having a party, meaning competition for leadership, you know, uh, you know the rounding up a posse in order to kind of prove your point. Uh, 
uh, and dividing the church up in this way, usually competition for leadership in the church. Uh, in uh, Titus chapter three, which we will get to in a little while, um, uh, Paul says, uh, give those people who are doing that two warnings and if they don't pay attention, uh, withdraw uh, from them. Here it says three, my notes say two. Um, now, in the case of uh, these two brothers that he's mentioned, who blasphemed, in other words, they spoke with disrespect concerning God or concerning sacred ideas or things, you know, his word. In their case, it was promoting false doctrine over the gospel. So turning over to Satan or discipline likely means they were withdrawn from. You know, if the church withdraws from you and you don't have the fellowship of the church, who do you have fellowship with? Well, you have fellowship with the devil because there's only two camps here. There's a, the, the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. So if the kingdom of light withdraws from you, you're in the kingdom of, uh, of, of darkness. And when you're withdrawn from, this means that you can't enjoy the fellowship with other Christians or the blessing of hearing God's word or sharing communion or worshiping and uh, other activities and spiritually strengthening activities that the church is involved in. You know, Jesus said, uh, you're either with him or you're with Satan. So if you're separated from Christians, you're separated from Christ, then that puts you with Satan, whether you like it or not. So, uh, you know, there is discipline in the church and there's discipline for a variety of reasons and a variety of ways. My, my thing has always been, we need to make sure that we use the right type of discipline for the, the various types of sin or uh, disobedience that, uh, the, that uh, is causing uh, problems. And so Paul continues his encouragement of, of uh, Timothy. Um, number one, uh, he encourages him to fight the battle with confidence because he's been called and equipped by God for this battle. Remember, the ones who have the secret knowledge, their whole idea is that they have a superior intellect. They have a superior message. You know, the others are just ignorant. They don't understand. And when people kind of get up to their level, they'll be able to understand. So that, you know, that idea may have been uh, intimidating uh, to Timothy, who was a young man. And so Paul says, you know, and he'll mention it later about his youth, but he's, he'll, he's telling him here, hey, you have had a legitimate calling from Christ himself through the, uh, through the Holy Spirit uh, spoken by the prophets and elders in the church. So you were called legitimately and you have a legitimate message, the gospel. I taught, I, Paul, taught you the gospel and now you're teaching it to them. You, you, you know, rest on your, and have confidence on your calling and have confidence in your message, he's saying. And then he says, sometimes uh, uh, punishment is necessary. Sometimes in the church there needs to be some discipline. Um, uh, and there needs to be discipline for the good of the brethren. And uh, he, he, you know, he gives an example here uh, of two individuals that need to, to, be, uh, to be disciplined. Okay, so we're going to stop here. Uh, next time we're going to look at some practical advice on the true role of men and women in the church. So he shifts from you know, encouraging Timothy, uh, you know, especially in light of uh, some of the things that these uh, false teachers were doing in the church, the trouble they were causing. Now he's going to switch into a more practical mode and we're going to start dealing with various issues in the church, uh, you know, the role of men and women and so on and so forth. And so we're going to start knocking these down. Uh, as we continue studying uh, Paul's letter to Timothy. Well, that's it for this time. We'll, uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you for your attention.